Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> as we continue on in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew is presenting Jesus as the... <laughs> the king, right? As the king. We start with chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He's from the line of David. We see the birth of the king, the announcement of the king, the Magi's coming, presenting gifts to the king. And so Matthew is presenting Jesus as the king. So throughout the whole book of Matthew, he's presenting Jesus to the Jews that he is the king of the Jews. And so remember that. That's the main theme the foundation of the book of Matthew as you read through it. And he continues with that theme in chapter 3 when he is tempted by the devil and approved by his victory over the temptations of the devil. And so he has the authority and the power and the trust and faith in his father that he has a plan for his life and he's not going to give in to the enemy and follow his plan. And that's what a king does. He stands up for righteousness. He stands for what is truth. And he fights the battles. And he's in the midst of a war. He doesn't sit back and let others do it. He is the example of doing it. And that's what Jesus did for us. He is truly a king. And so this morning we'll be looking at verses 12 through 17. Which um, aren't too in-depth, it takes us through some geographical areas and for a purpose, and we're going to focus on probably verse 16 more than, than anywhere else in 17, uh, but those geographical areas are important to understand them uh, so we know what Jesus is really doing here as he starts his Galilean ministry. Now we know the Bible says that the Apostle John, who made it very clear that God so loved the world that he gave, uh, and he showed that love by giving his son, his only son, his only begotten son, uh, the only son that he had. He gave that son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. How does God love the world? By giving his gift of his son to the world. What did they do with his son? Well, we know what they did with his son, and yet he still gave his son so that men would believe in his son, the work of his son, and the ultimate victory of his son, that they would then have eternal life. We live in a dark world. We live in a very dark world. We live in a dark community. We live in a dark area here as a church, and what this dark world needs, dark community, dark area, is light. It needs light. It doesn't mean that, that, that the sun ha, has dawned, that it's disappearing, that there is no light and, and it's just darkness. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about sin, a sinful world, a, a world of flesh. And what this world needs is truth. This world needs to understand righteousness. This world needs to know there's purpose for us being here, that God created us for a reason. And so Jesus came to be the light of the world he came to be the light of the world and that's our theme this morning we ended in verse 11 where the devil left jesus uh, to come back at another opportune time luke tells us and angels came and ministered to jesus and now he's ready to get into the ministry in a sense he's been preparing the the battle of prayer the battle of uh, of, of the enemy and in being victorious through the scriptures and through the word of god now he's ready to get into the ministry and begin to be that light to the world and when we come to verse 12 here in chapter 4 there seems to be a gap between verse 11 and 12. All of a sudden, we get into a quick verse of John the Baptist, and then we move on from there. Nothing is explained, nothing is told of him. It's just very quickly. And so there's a gap there, and it's probably about a year gap. Uh, so Matthew just doesn't explain uh, that Judean ministry of Jesus there. Uh, with John the Baptist uh, and, and so forth. And in a year's time, a lot can happen in a year's time, right? I mean, we can, we can see uh, someone have a baby in a year's time. We just in several months had, had three, and there's still another one coming within another five months or so. So we can have a year, uh, in a year's time a baby, or someone can graduate high school in a year's time, or someone can get married within a year's time. Someone can even die in a year's time. A lot can happen in one year. A lot. This world can turn around 
towards the light or this world can go into deeper darkness. A lot can happen. John the Baptist was beheaded within that year's time. And Matthew doesn't give us those details. Uh, John's arrest and execution will come not until chapter 14 in Matthew, and he'll deal with it. But from this point on, he, he, is, get, he is beginning his Galilean ministry. He's going to go to his home base, Capernaum, and he's going to establish that. And then he, from there, he's going to go out and be the light to a dark world. And he's going to give us the Sermon on the Mount there in um, chapter 5 all the way to about chapter 8 or 9 or so forth. And we're going to learn so many good principles through those sermon notes uh, of Jesus there. Following his temptation there in the wilderness, Jesus returns to the region of Galilee and begins to be, uh, be a preacher and a teacher and also healing. So the theme is a great light. Let's look at verse 12 as we, we see briefly uh, John in prison. Now, when Jesus had, or when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. That's all Matthew tells us. He heard that John was put into prison, and so he left. Again, he'll deal with that later on. Matthew doesn't give us all the accounts of John the Baptist. He doesn't tell us about the the party that Herod threw. He doesn't tell us about the head that that was put on a platter that was given to his uh, daughter and so forth that was supposed to dance for him and so forth. Uh, He focuses on Jesus, the king. He leaves out Jesus' Judean ministry here, uh, which covers a a good part of uh, verse 1 through through, 3. well, if you go back to John chapter 1 all the way through to chapter 4, and then Luke chapter 4 uh, gives a per- part of it. Uh, Matthew will deal with the Galilean ministry, which uh, is the majority of his um, writing. Fourteen chapters are dealt with this Galilean ministry that he is about to go on. So it says he departed to Galilee. John's ministry was, in a sense, decreasing so that Jesus' ministry would increase. And now that John is out of the scene, Jesus will become a very popular man. And I love the the scripture that is written about John and and what he said when he realized that Jesus was the Messiah. And he said this, he said, He must increase and I must decrease. I love that scripture. I've fallen on that scripture so many times, especially when I struggle with myself and my flesh and, and what I think that I need or what my rights are or what I think is truth, uh, what I think should be the right way of doing things, I've fallen on that scripture many times. Because I also find that I have no control over those things. I have no control over people's lives. I have no control over ministry uh, situations sometimes. Oh, I can control them, but ultimately I have to learn to decrease so that Jesus increases and allow Him to do what He wants to do. And that's what John is saying. Look, I need to get out of the picture. I need to die so that Jesus can continue on. I need to lose popularity. I need to allow my disciples to move on, is what he's saying. And so there's a lot there when you think about it for us. We need to die to ourselves. We need to take our children and we need to disciple them and let them move on to serve the Lord. And we do that by example, by what we do because they watch you. And whatever it is you're doing, they'll do when they grow up. So think about what you're doing, and are you dying to yourself, and are you teaching them to do that also? And then training them to go out. We need to do that in ministry. We need to die to self and allow people to use the gifts that God has given them, and replacing ourselves, basically, uh, with others so that the ministry can grow and not holding on to the ministry as though itself. John could have hold on to it, right? He would have said, no, this is my ministry. Why am I going to give it up? Someone tell Jesus, get me out of jail, and I'll help him. I'll be a part of his ministry. Boy, they'll follow me. They'll follow him. Boy, this ministry will really grow. But that's not what he did. He realized that it had to be Jesus because Jesus had to come and die for the sins of the world. So someone said that this Judean ministry uh, basically uh, was going nowhere for Jesus. But the Galilean ministry was going everywhere. So the death of John opened up the door to go everywhere. Charles Spurgeon said, as the morning star is hidden, the sun shines the more brightly. Right? In a sense, as that morning star, that last star, 
when the sun begins to rise, as it diminishes, all of a sudden the sun just rises up and it shines brightly. So as John diminished, Jesus was able to shine. As we diminish, as we lose ourself, as we think of ourselves less highly than others, then God begins to work in our lives. That's how we need to look at ourselves. The imprisonment of John called our Lord away from the persecution of Satan to a more rustic region of Galilee. It's a, not a large area, but it is a very fruitful and a very um, considerable population. Josephus observes that it had all been cultivated and that there was no wasteland and that the smallest village had more than 15,000 inhabitants, he said. As a child, Jesus was there in Galilee. We see that in chapter 3 where Herod had attempted to kill uh, Jesus, but he ended up killing a lot of children. And now he comes from Galilee and he begins to part, depart to Galilee, region area there. So he's establishing his ministry in these last verses from 13 through 5 to 25 there, the rest of this chapter. He's establishing his home base. He's establishing his disciples. He's getting ready to move out, basically. And we'll see that next week with the disciples. So verses 13 through 17 begins that ministry in Galilee. Look at verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Nebula. Now, Nazareth was where he went earlier. We find that in chapter 2 so that he could be called a Nazarene. You remember that? That fulfilled the scripture there. So he moved there to Nazareth so that men could call him a Nazarene, fulfillment of what the Old Testament said. Matthew then gives us a transition here from, from the, the wilderness temptation to John the Baptist to now he's transitioning. Now he's going to Capernaum. He's dwelling in Capernaum. And Capernaum is by the sea. And it's in the land of Nephulon and Zebulon. Since people were generally... Unable to afford transportation, it was very hard to move around. And so normally you would live in a certain area and die in that area. You didn't go visiting. You didn't have a, a little Honda. You didn't have motorcycles. You know, you had a little mule, and if you even had a mule. And so it was hard to get around to certain areas. And so people usually were born and they were buried in the places they live. But Jesus wasn't about living, Jesus was about dying. And Jesus was about fulfilling the prophetic, prophetic plan of God. And so he needed to go to Capernaum there. Now the geographical location of Capernaum is by the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful place. As you look from Capernaum down at the Sea of Galilee, it's, it's a walking distance. And, and I walk down to the water. It's very cold. But off to the, the right of that, as you're looking south down the, the Sea of Galilee, are huge mountain ranges. And from those mountain ranges is where the, the winds blow to hit the mountains and it goes through the valleys and sometimes comes around the Sea of Galilee and that's why you had storms there in that area. The, the, the wind would just blow on the sea and then cause these storms, sometimes huge storms because the wind was just so strong. And as you look at the sea, it's just, it, it looks almost, if, if I can give it a, a picture, if you go to uh, Lake uh, Arrowhead, and there's a little bridge there in the middle of it on the east side and look at it. It's kind of like that with a lot of trees and so forth. And, and you come up to the dirt and a few rocks and then you hit the water. Above it is Capernaum. There is a synagogue there. And that is where Jesus went, as was his custom, to go on Sunday mornings to church and to sit and listen to the rabbis. Just below that is where they believe Peter may have had a home and he lived and grew up. Now, it says that it's in the land of Zebulon and Nephula. These were the children of Jacob. God had divided the area, the land there, to his different tribes, 12 tribes there. And Nephula and Zebula were on the north of Capernaum there. And so he gives us the area there, and he gives it to us for a reason. Uh, Nephulon and Zebula were faithful in battles, but they weren't faithful in conquering the land. And so by this time, the territory here that was supposed to be Jewish uh, really did not 
populate as well as it should have. Because of the Persian um, period and the captivity and bondage into Babylon, and then you remember the Jews were scattered all over the place, a lot of them didn't go back to Zebulon and Nebula. And so during the time of Jesus' day, most of the people there were Gentiles. Most of them were descendants of, of Jewish settlers or, or less of them. There was a small fishing village, possibly where Peter and them had a, a little big business there in that area. And also a Roman settlement near the Sea of Galilee, which served as a center of the Roman government in the northern province of Israel. And so you get this picture of this little community, fishing community, and also governmental community. And Jesus is coming there to make it you know, his hometown, his base, his main office, and then from there he will go out. So he leaves Nazareth also in fulfilling what Isaiah chapter 9 says, and that's why he gives us these details. So verse 14 says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying. Now Jesus is moving according to divine prophecy here. And that's my point. Now this, is, this might be boring to you. Well, I, don't, I, I hated geography in school, so did I. I hated history in school. Yeah, I did too. I didn't like it. And he's like, who cares? What does that have to do with me now? I want to go play football. It's like it doesn't have anything to do. But to know the history here and what Jesus is dealing with is so important. But also to understand that Jesus, every step that Jesus takes is fulfilling prophecy. There's a purpose behind it all. Just like in your life, there's a purpose behind everything that you're doing. And some of us have been sidetracked. Some of us are not fulfilling that purpose. Well, how do you know that? How do you know that me not fulfilling the purpose is fulfilling the purpose? Wow, okay. Because uh, this is how I know, because the scriptures reveal what our purpose is and we're to, we're to serve God. We're to glorify God in everything that we do. And if you're not glorifying God, if you're not serving God, then you're not fulfilling your purpose. And so in your whole life, as you serve him, it is to reflect Jesus Christ to this dying world in every aspect of your life. So Jesus is moving according to divine purpose. And we can be encouraged that we're moving just right along with him divinely as we serve him. And again, Matthew is quoting Isaiah. Not because Isaiah writes well, but because Isaiah wrote prophetically. There's the word of the Lord came to him. And this word was for the future, that Jesus would come to a land of Zebulon and Nebulon, just as Isaiah said. Look at verse 15. The land of Zebulon and the land of Nebulon, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So it was a Gentile city. Not that Jesus was going to the Gentiles, but he was going to the Jews in that area. Jesus preached a lot there in Capernaum, but you remember they wouldn't listen to him or hear him. Their hearts were hard, and he was saddened because of that. Now, the way of the Jordan, and it's interesting that the, the river that flowed from Mount Hermon, which those mountains that I was talking about, south into the Sea of Galilee, uh, flowed into the Sea of Galilee, and then Galilee went down the Jordan River and then ended up in the Dead Sea. So it's a beautiful hourglass as you look at it. It starts off with Mount Hermon, the mountains flowing into the Sea of Galilee, which is very huge, and then kind of narrowing down to Jordan, and then ending up in the Sea of Galilee, or I'm sorry, the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea today is, is very dry. It's actually created a, a walkway between the sea. It's kind of divided the Dead Sea in half where now you can actually almost walk right across to the other side of the, uh, the mountain range, which, by the way, is interesting because that's where Petra is at. And so when the Jews are persecuted, how are they going to get there? So they can now walk over through that area pretty much. So again, the point of this prophecy is that Jesus is coming to dwell in Capernaum, making it his hometown now verse 16 the people who sat that is there in capernaum in galilee in darkness have seen a great light and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death light has dawned so we know light is jesus and he's come to a dark place and he's illuminating the truth of God. These people that he is talking about are the ones that are sitting and living and dwelling in these places. And in the Greek, it signifies their character and their habitual lives are of darkness, of a flesh. Just like today, we live in a world of darkness. 
We live in a world that is selfish. We live in a world that all it cares about is itself. Jesus was living in the same world there. And he came to be a great light upon those who sat in the regions there and the shadows of death. And it personifies the word death here. They are close to death, in other words, for they are in its shadow. And the term that also points to the lack of light because they're in death itself. Uh, they're dying. And there's a lack of light there, and because of the lack of light, it, they are dying. A lack of light will kill things. If you plant plants, we, like we planted some plants here under this, this shade, and the sun comes from, from this side, it doesn't get too much light over here, and you'll notice that some of the plants are dying because they're dwelling in a shade, in darkness in a sense, and it doesn't get enough light, and so some of the plants can't take it, and they're dying. And if you dwell in darkness long enough, you will die. The ultimate end is death, for the wages of sin is what? Death. The Bible says. And so as you're living in sin and dwelling in sin and participating in sin, you are slowly killing yourself. You really are until you die completely and Satan wins. Now, as you live in sin, this is what's so neat about God. He's come to save you. And as you're living in sin and dwelling in sin, he can still save you. He can still have grace on you. He can still love you. Even until the point where you're in your dying bed and he shows up again and he illuminates, he brings that light in that dark place and you go, Lord, boy, I have lived such a bad life. But boy, if you can save me right now, you know, I would be so appreciative of that. And he does. And then you die and you enter into heaven because you have received the light. As you're sinning, you're dying. But you're not dead. And so there's still hope for you there. Now he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 9. And it's interesting, if you want to turn there, you can. In verse 1, it's, he says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Nebuli. And so, in other words, because of their, again, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, the bondage of the children of Israel because of the idolatry and the sin. So God had to humble them, bringing them into bondage uh, during the time of, uh, of Daniel, Zechariah, um, Jeremiah, and so forth. He led them into bondage, and he humbled them to a certain degree. And they became uh, people that lived in darkness. He says, but, and here's the prophecy, but in the future... He will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea. Along the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. So he quotes Isaiah 9, verse 2, that a great light they would encounter in their great darkness. People are habitually in darkness, a darkness of the mind and a darkness of the flesh. And it's very clear as we look at our world today. This land that Jesus is living in at this moment, uh, inhabitants are spiritually completely dead. They have no truth or morals whatsoever. They're living by their own decisions and their own choices. So they really belong to death itself. The government is their death in a sense. So there's a possibility that, that the people in Jerusalem regarded this country, this area, as a dark place. In fact, the leaders probably neglected the area, and that's why there weren't so many Jews there, and they left it over to the Gentiles. So these people needed a light to come. And so Jesus is going to deal with them as he becomes the light of the world. Let's turn to John chapter 1 real quick. That's right in your Bibles. Verse... Uh, 6 of John chapter 1. <clears throat> now after John goes through the deity of Jesus Christ there and how all things were made through him, he says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that's Jesus Christ, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, that is John wasn't the light but was sent to bear witness of that light. 
You know, John never did any signs, any wonders, never anything like that. He just baptized. And so he was to bear witness of the light himself. He was not to draw attention to himself at all. That was the true light, he says, which gives light to every man who comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They were born again. And he'll talk about that in chapter 3 there. And so this light that John came to bear witness has come to save men in their darkness. Think about the world today and what's going on in our world today. Not our own lives. Let's, let's, not, let's put that aside at this moment, just our personal darkness. Because we're all in darkness. We, we live in darkness to certain degrees. We all have pride. We all get angry. And, and there are different displays of anger uh, you can be a person that, that just emotionally displays that anger screaming and yelling and so forth or, or you can be a person that's angry inside and you are displaying it differently you can be in total control but behind the scenes you know you are stabbing people in the back you are talking you're you know just all there's all kinds of different uh, ways of being angry we we most of us probably deal with one of those the others of, of anger of pride of selfishness that uh, we're selfish people we're just that's just there's darkness there in our lives we can get even more personal and, and talk about the pornography that you're viewing we can talk about the fantasies and those things we're dark people living in dark places and yet jesus still loves you isn't that amazing he still loves you his grace is still being poured on you you're not walking right. You're not walking according to the word. You're walking your own will, doing it your own way. Yet he still loves you. He still pours his grace on you. He's still illuminating your life. Because he's trying to draw you through kindness and through love. That whatever you do, he's there until the very end where you will have that ultimate choice. Let's not talk about that. I just did, but let's not talk about it. Let's talk about what's going on in the world today. Uh, I got this email from uh, Jay Sekulow. There's an assignment being given to students in at least one public school. These kids are being indoctrinated into Islam. They've been forced to watch documentaries and other in-class work to prepare them. All across the country, there are reports of innocent children being taught to pray Islamic prayers, make prayer rugs, and practice other Islamic rituals. At the same time, Christian schools, school children are being harassed about bringing Bibles to school and about praying, which are their constitutional rights. No student should be indoctrinated into Islam in our schools. Is Islam a representation of light or of darkness? It's darkness. It's very clear. I just heard a story where a lady was saying, well, you know nothing about Islam. You need to read the Bible, Islam. They're a people of peace. And the guy says, well, let me ask you, have you read the book of Islam? She said, no, I haven't read it. Well, then how do you know they're a people of peace? You're telling me to read the book and you haven't read it and you're jumping to the conclusions of what others have said to you, that it's a religion of peace? My mother-in-law said that their God is our God. It's Allah, God, which is their God, is the same God as ours. No, not true. Their God is a God of hatred. Their God is a God of murder. They are killing people, and now they're trying to indoctrinate our children. Got another article from Repairing the Foundations, and it's to pastors <clears throat> about what's going on out there in our country and what we need to do as pastors. And they're calling on pastors to rise up and, and take political stands. But it's a story about the 20 Egyptian Christians and one other man that was beheaded. How many of you heard that, those, that story there? About those 21 uh, men that were beheaded by Isa. <clears throat> so he writes this article about Christian beheading, testing our faith. 
He says, I can't explain why. Perhaps it doesn't require explanation, but as the calendar quickly moved forward, Easter Sunday, this past Easter, the more an image flashed in my mind, 20 Egyptian Christians and one other man forced to their knees on a Mediterranean beach by members of ISA, February 15th, and asked one by one if they believed in Jesus Christ. Each answered yes, knowing the consequences, and all 21 were beheaded. Now he goes on and he says, In order to write this column, I felt it was necessary to watch a beheading on YouTube. A beheading is not swift. Death is not instant. Now, when I read this article several weeks ago, I decided I wanted to watch a beheading also because I've never seen one. And, and so I saw a beheading, and it was more of a hacking where they had the individual on his hands and knees and the, and the guy had the, the guy's head in his hand, his hair, with, with a sh machete in the other hand and he whacked. So it wasn't whack and then the head came off. It was whacking until the head came off. And then I thought about some of the other beheadings that I saw where they didn't have a machete. They had a little knife and they had them on the grounds and they were cutting like this and you could hear them screaming and yelling. And then finally their heads come off and their eyes are still open. And they put their heads on top of the body. Okay, now I'm being a little graphic here and I apologize for that, but I want you to understand what's coming, what could be coming. Personally, I don't believe that we'll stand for it to an ultimate end. I think that people will rise up and, and fight and then it will be taken care of. But I think it's a beginning of the end times. It's the beginning of the end for the United States. That's just one aspect of how we're being attacked in this world. So he goes on, <clears throat> says, I do not recommend watching, and I don't, I don't either. You know, the other thing, I'm going to be honest with you right now, too, while, while I'm talking about this. The other thing that, that, that just surprised me was my hardness towards watching the video. It didn't, um, it didn't gross me out. It didn't make me sick. I wasn't, whoa, you know, by it. I, I was more in awe of what the men were chanting and, and the way that they were chanting, the excitement in them that I could see it was demonic. They had to be possessed by demons to do that. But I was saddened by the fact, and I even prayed in my heart, and said, Lord, what's wrong with me? That I'd be so hard to see something like that. But it's, a prep, it's the preparation that our world has, has been influencing upon us throughout these years by showing us the movies, by showing us the games and the shootings and things like that, that we're not sensitive to that stuff anymore. And so when we hear about it, we're like, oh, okay. It doesn't really bother us. And that's what's sad. And that's what's going to be the demise of our nation is that we're not sensitive to those things. And we need to think about that. Maybe we won't get sensitive to it, but we need to be prepared to battle it might be a good thing at the same time because are you capable of killing an, or killing an individual? Not murdering, killing, which is two separate things. Killing, you can kill someone who's attacking you. Uh, but premeditated murder, that's different. You don't kill someone, plan it all out because you want them dead. But to kill someone if they're attacking your family or your children, then you have that right as a human being and as a citizen of the United States. He goes on and says, in order to write this, okay, let me move on. I do not recommend watching it, but it gave me a deeper understanding of what must have gone through the minds of the 21 men and countless other Christians who have been beheaded by ISA. He goes on and he says, what would you do if you were in that situation? And they asked you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? How would you answer? How many would say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ? I mean, we will all probably say that, but would you really? Would you really? Think about it. This is how one person uh, answered, uh, friends of his, <clears throat> said, uh, yeah, I, be I believe in Jesus, but when I think about it, about never seeing my husband, never seeing my family, never seeing my grandchildren, never seeing my great-grandchildren, all of a sudden I paused. Maybe there's more to it. Another friend said, I believe each Christian would always be ready to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. However, after watching two beheadings on YouTube, it gave me pause for thought. 
How could I possibly endure torture and pain, slow death for my beliefs? My next thought was, but that's what Jesus did for me. Would he expect any less from me? Another person said, this is, of course, an impossible question to answer. Under the circumstances, I cannot imagine what I would do. It is always easier to sit in your living room and be convinced of your own virtues under the proposed circumstances. I also know I can rationalize decisions and I can waffle between what I want and what I know to be true. I see this part of me rationalize that it's more important for me to live for any or for all of the following, my friends, my wife, my children, extended family and church. Isn't that true? I can see someone saying, you know what? No, I don't believe in Jesus. He'll forgive me after when they let me go and I go back to the United States, I'm at home. Then I'll just rededicate my life to him. I could see someone rationalize like that. Right? I mean, that makes sense. But what an opportunity to go as a martyr itself. I can't say, I can say this. How many times have you been asked to live for Jesus, but you do the opposite? I mean, if I'd say, would you live for Jesus? We'd all raise our hands, but are you living for Jesus? Is it real here? Let me just, uh, quick, how many of you are tithing? Well, ah, let me rationalize that. <coughs> okay, how many of you are serving? Ah. <coughs> how many of you really would give your life to Jesus? Come on, let's be honest, we don't know. I can, there was a time when pastors were at the pulpit and they're saying, you know, I'm dying. I'm at the pulpit and I die and I hit the ground and you know I'm dying. Leave me alone. Let me go to heaven. You know, don't, don't, don't call the paramedics. Don't call the ambulance. Let me die. That's what I, I want to go to heaven. And I, I, I knew a pastor who actually did that and he was dying and he did everything to live. He had been one that said, no, just let me die. His liver was failing and if he didn't get it replaced, he would be, he would be dead. So he did everything to live got a liver transplant, and he did live. He, he lived for, they said, five years, and he's already gone on, on 20, 20 years. So he's got an extended life because of it. You know. What we say and what we do are two totally different. Oh, I'm brave. I'm strong. But when it really happens, I'm a coward. <laughs> and you start running. Lord, I will not deny you. I will go to the end with you, Peter. Before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. We need, to, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we need to pray that God would give us the strength at that moment to do the right thing, because we don't know. If you think that you can do the right thing, that's pride. That's what Peter fell into, pride. Lord, I would never deny you. I can't say that anymore, because I've denied him plenty times in my walk with him in many different ways. He goes on to Annie, he says, consider the 21 men. Notice that I wrote in the third paragraph, 20 Egyptian Christians and one other man. The 21st man was a non-believer. According to Abram Canadian News, the man became a believer in Christ after watching one by one his fellow captives refuse to say Jesus wasn't their Lord and Savior. When it came his time to answer, he told the terrorists, Their God is my God. He knew he was going to die. And so at that moment, he accepted Jesus Christ. We're all dying. But God's at a very moment in time, light will come in and we'll have an opportunity to accept him. He accepted him and he went to heaven. He could have denied him. He would have beheaded him. And he would have died for eternity in hell. But he lived. He lived. Do we live in a dark world we sure do guys we need to understand that we live in a dark world and jesus has come to be a light you are the hope of this world every one of us here are the hope to bring light to the world to bring light to truth to live that light because they want to see it lived they don't want to see it talked they're tired of seeing it talked aren't you tired of people talking and then they don't follow through on what they talk about It can get really discouraging when people say one thing and they do another. Jesus has come to your dark world to give you hope for the future. Man has fallen short of the glory of God and light has dawned through Jesus Christ. He has come to the Galileans to begin his ministry as a light. Look at verse 17. 
And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so from that point on, he, t- he pretty much uh, took off where John left off. And he began to hurl the gospel boldly to the world. That they needed to repent. They needed to turn from their sins. Agree with God that you're a sinner, that you're living in darkness. Confess it. Don't do it anymore, which repentance means you won't go back to it. And start walking in the opposite direction towards the light. Start living for God because the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's talking about himself. He is the king of the kingdom of God. And Matthew's presenting him as a king. He he uses that term more than anyone else in the gospels here. Jesus is the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God in his presence, has gone to heaven and sitting at the right hand of the Father. So the kingdom of God is coming, but at the same time, the kingdom of God is still here with us because we are all his disciples in that kingdom and he dwells within us. And so the kingdom of God is still here through us and we have an opportunity to be light to this world because it is so dark. I hope that you'll take that opportunity. I hope that you'll be honest with yourself and say, Lord, I need to repent in some areas. There's some darkness in my life and I need to hand that over to you. I need to allow you to illuminate my heart and my ways. I need to stop lying. I need to stop cheating. I need to be honest with you and you alone. He is our shepherd. I'm not your shepherd. You don't have to come to me. You have to go to him. You'll stand before him. I'm the under shepherd. I'm proclaiming, in a sense, his word to you and you need to either agree with it. If you have need... If you need no man to teach you, then you will understand it and agree with it. If you're following someone else's philosophy, then you're going to follow that philosophy. That philosophy may be yours because you've made it up. Let us live by the word of God alone, as Jesus said in his temptations. Let's pray and then we'll partake of communion.